Hello, this is Linda A. Malcor, and I'm going to be doing an interview today about my nonfiction writing. What inspired you to become a writer? What inspired me to become a writer was actually writing in school. Um, I just uh, love doing research papers and uh, book reports and all that sort of uh, thing. Um, I, I, was, I really liked writing and then uh, reading them before the class. How many books have you written and which is your favorite? I've written two nonfiction books that were published by um, big name presses. And uh, one was 27 and a half years ago and it's never been out of print. That's from Scythia to Camelot. And one just came out, it's called Artorius, The Real King Arthur. And then I've got lots of books, I've lost count where I've done like a chapter in other people's books, or I've um, uh, written a paper that's been included in a book with a bunch of papers, or I've done a short story that's included with a bunch of other short stories, um, stuff like that. My nonfiction writers are, uh, my nonfiction papers are um, academic papers, usually uh, given over in Europe somewhere. What is the current project you're working on? My current project that I'm working on is a book about the story of the sword and the stone. And I'm co-authoring the book with John Matthews, who is a British uh, mythologist. And we're uh, com communicating via Zoom and uh, Gmail. Oh. How does your writing impact family life? My nonfiction writing impacts family life by... Um, giving me a lot less time to deal with um, family members. I would have to be dropped off at a university and my husband would take um, my kids away and do something with them for hours at a time while I plowed through library books. And when I was home, I had to wait till all hours of the night to sit and do research on the computer. Um, I'm one of these strange people that actually sits around and reads Latin inscriptions for fun. So I've got the bookcase behind me has a lot of my Roman uh, history in it. And uh, I um, had to train my dogs to make sure that they don't eat the books when I have them out on the floor. Because um, I tend to have uh, my floor covered with books uh, as I'm trying to put things together. How does your writing have current impact on your social life? My writing has a great uh, impact on my social life. I don't have much of a social life because I spend most of my time writing. Um, it's hard for writers to make money, very hard. You don't get much off your uh, work. So the only way to get any kind of a decent set of royalties is you have to keep your seat in your chair and you have to uh, keep writing. Um, uh, brawn uh, makes more money than uh, brains or uh, creativity, so um, the money is not placed in the arts in the United States. That's pretty much true around the world. Um, so you have to, you, um, you just if you want to be a writer, give up the idea that you're going to be rich and famous like J.K. Rowling, and if you are rich and famous, um, that's great. That's a nice plus, but odds are you're not going to be rich and famous. Do you write under a pseudonym? Why or why not? I do not write under a pseudonym um, in my nonfiction in particular because um, I have an academic profile that I have to keep up. And I'm, I'm known from conferences and giving lectures, particularly overseas. Um, and people will buy my books and buy my um, uh, books that have my writing in them just because they know my name. What is your educational background? My educational background is I have a BA in English um, with minors in comparative literature and history from Occidental College. And then I have a master's in Celtic studies and in narrative from UCLA. And I have a PhD in um, uh, Indo-European comparative mythology and uh, medieval studies. Those last two, um, the master's and the PhD, are in folklore and mythology. And 
Folklore is a subdivision of anthropology. A lot of people think it's not a serious discipline and it's a very serious discipline. Um, do you get writer's block when writing nonfiction? Writing nonfiction is um, a little more difficult than writing fiction. I um, do a I follow the Chicago Manual of Style, and one of the parts of the formatter is a table of contents, and I try to follow that outline, but in the middle of writing a book, you often um, have situations where the outline you came up with originally just isn't working, and you have to rearrange things. And that means you have to go back and redo the table of contents and remember all the chapters before and after and shuffle things around. So it's um, very time consuming. What is your writing software of choice? I write in Microsoft Word. Um, I uh, used to write in WordPerfect and I was very upset when my older version of uh, WordPerfect went away. I started out writing on a prime mainframe and was one of the uh, earliest ones to use code to um, do my headers, my footers, my um, margins. Um, I write with a lot of foreign characters, so I had codes I had to use to uh, put in the, the foreign characters. Um, and uh, then I figured out how to do that in WordPerfect, and, and the WordPerfect version I used got discontinued, and I had to learn how to do it in Microsoft Word, which is time consuming because you have to open up the symbols window and find the symbol you want and put insert the symbol you want and then go into the next letter of the word and probably have to do the same thing. So um, that that's uh, not my favorite thing in the world to do. Um, I like uh, writing by hand a lot. The problem is as I get older, it's hard to read my own writing. What is your writing process like? My writing process is I get a general idea and do a ton of research. And it takes me about five years to do a book. Um, I uh, research in the library. I have a general idea where the book's gonna go or at least what the topic is. And I make a lot of notes, a lot of photocopies. And nowadays I do a lot of scanning I do uh, work research on the internet, and uh, then I haul out the Chicago Manual of Style and start following the pattern for writing a book. So you have the title page, you have the half title page, you have a uh, forward introduction, table of contents, oh, and you have um, a dedication page where you dedicate uh, the book to somebody, and uh, then you start with your chapters and um, you just go chapter one through ever, however many chapters uh, you have. Usually it's about 14, but uh, it can be more or less depending on the topic. Um, yeah, and then you have your appendix, your appendices and different things like that. What do you need to have in your writing space? I absolutely have to have a legal pad and lots of pens. I'm never without pens. Um, and I have to have enough space that I can uh, do my editing on my nonfiction work. And I, for that, I usually use my dining room table. There's usually very little room to eat on my dining room table. I have to have my printer and I have to have my laptop and I have a keyboard that's full size connected to my laptop because I'm a touch typist and the keys are too close together on a laptop for me to type well. And I have my mouse. Do you write articles as well as books? I write a lot of articles, um, far more than I write books. Um, every time I go to a conference, uh, I turn the paper into an article, usually for a proceedings of book. Um, I also uh, publish in um, um, journals, academic journals. I publish in other people's books, write chapters for them. Um, I uh, have um, stuff that I publish on the internet. Um, right now I'm writing an encyclopedia article and uh, just whatever the job requires, I, I, paid by, I can get paid by the job. 
Where would we find your articles on the interwebs? Um, you can Google me and uh, you will find my articles that way uh, on the net. Um, and uh, you, you will find a lot of them are in journals like uh, the Journal of Indo-European Studies. And it's behind a wall where you have to pay to get through the wall in order to read my work. Um, what when you're writing nonfiction, do you have a specific portion of um, the book that's difficult to write, or is is that dependent on the book you're writing? The part of the book that is hardest for me to write is the index. I hate doing an index. Fortunately, my current uh, co-author, John Matthews, um, who writes about mythology in Great Britain, um, he's got some kind of program that he uses to put together the index because uh, he also hates writing an index. I think that's probably what most nonfiction writers detest. Uh, which parts of your books have been the most fun to work on and write? The book, parts of the book that are most fun to work on is when I'm doing the chapters. Um, the most recent book I did was called Artorias, the Real King Arthur. And I loved writing the chapters because I already had the outline done for me. It was a memorial stone that belonged to a Roman soldier and it gave his career. And I was able to take the research uh, I did on uh, the different places and ranks um, in his career and just basically spin out the tale, almost like I would do a, a work of fiction, a non, yeah, fiction, um, and uh, tell the story of his life. It was a, um, it's kind of a biography. And uh, I, I found that really fun because it flowed. Um, normally I'm having trouble with the Sword and Stone book that I'm writing because it's all choppy and I'm gonna need in the editing to go back and make it flow. Do you find yourself doing a lot of research uh, for your book? I find myself doing a ton of research for the fiction works. Most of it never makes it, uh, its way into the book, um, but I have to know it um, in order to pick out what should go into the book and uh, what should be left aside. Um, I research... Um, Things that come along as I'm writing, um, like in Artorias, I um, researched, uh, he spent a lot, some of his time in the Middle East um, in the fort in the Jezreel Valley, and that's near the city of Nazareth. And so there I was researching um, early Christianity and found there was a town named Bethlehem, not far from Nazareth. It's not the Bethlehem that's so famous but it is called Bethlehem and it's right there. Um, I had to research what the uh, uh, legion stationed at the fort was doing and found that part of it was off at a battle site um, while um, the rest was monitoring this uh, trade road, uh, trying to keep the uh, traders safe as they uh, move their wares along the road. And it was near the Sea of Galilee, so I had to research what was going on in the Sea of Galilee. And it was also an old uh, battle site for uh, some of the old uh, valleys of the, Is or battles of the Israelites. And so even those, those didn't make it into the book, I had to know that was going on there because the uh, figure I was following uh, would have learned about uh, telling the difference between Jews and Christians and their backstories um, and stuff of the area he was patrolling. So he would uh, be able to tell um, who was who and what was going on and what was important to these people and what wasn't. And uh, that kind of knowledge came in handy to him later in his career. Where have you traveled to research for your, for your books? The main places I've traveled to do research for my books um, were Italy, where I went to Rome, Naples, Pompeii, um, and uh, I need to go a lot of other places there. Um, Baia, which is uh, near Naples, uh, it's where um, the naval, main naval base for the Romans was located, and Padstrana, 
um, is in Croatia. I went there and that's the village where uh, the memorial stone for Lucas Artorius Castus is. And uh, when the local historian hauled me all around to different villages in the area. Uh, one was called Igraine, same name as Arthur's mother. Um, another was a site of uh, the grave of Castus's daughter. And we had to do some serious hiking to get to that. Um, a lot of the Roman ruins are just scattered around in people's backyards and stuff like that. We're still looking for the actual villa that he lived in. Um, we think it might be on the site where the main church is located because a lot of uh, Roman villas were turned into churches, but we're not sure. We're still researching it. Uh, the memorial stone for Castus is located at the chapel of St. Martin, uh, which is down near the waterside. And the graveyard's still in use. Um, his tomb was broken up into pieces to make the wall of the chapel. So we're trying to get permission from the Vatican to excavate it and see if we can find any more information about it. How much do your nonfiction books change from the first draft to the published book? My nonfiction books change a lot from the first draft to the published book. Um, Usually it involves moving chapters around. Sometimes you delete information, sometimes you add it. Um, I read the whole thing aloud to see if there's anything that's, uh, that jars the ear and I change all that. Um, uh, formatting is a real big deal in the editing process. Which aspects of your nonfiction work have challenged you uh, the most? Uh, the aspects of my nonfiction work, or, yeah, nonfiction work uh, that have challenged me the most are finding the information that I need for a given chapter. Um, you, I generally have to go to a nonfiction. Uh, library, a big big university library, because a small library is not going to have the information I'm needing. I have in this bookcase a whole bunch of books that I've required for my writing in Rome, and because uh, I got tired of going to the library to check them out. Um, and they're expensive. These type of nonfiction books, research books, are really expensive. So there, this has been collected over a number of years probably 40 years, and they, um, it, it's hard to remember where things are. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of information in there. You gotta remember the book, and uh, then hopefully the page. I used to be able to run into a university library, get on the right floor, find the right bookshelf, find the right book on that shelf, and open it to roughly the page I needed. But that was back when I was working on my PhD and had been using these books a lot. Um, now I have to spend a lot more time looking for things that I need and uh, figuring out if I don't have it, where can I get it? Is it online? Do I have to run to a library? Does this particular library have the information I need? And um, all that sort of thing. Uh, so yeah, the research is really rough. <laughs> As we're in Southern California and we have a plethora of universities around, how do you know if a particular university will have the information that you need for your research? I kind of know which universities specialize in, they have departments in the area of research that I need. So like Saddleback University doesn't have the works that I need that much because they don't, um, concentrate in the areas that I research. Um, UC universities are great at it. Um, UC uh, Irvine had, specializes in medieval literature, but it still has a good uh, Roman section. UCLA is the best research library, but it's kind of far from me now, so it's hard for me to get up there. And it's such a long drive, you don't just go for a couple of hours, you go for the entire day. So it's hard to um, hard to work there. Um, how do you use social media at, 
for your nonfiction work? Mm, social media for my nonfiction book um, books, I uh, have a page for each of the books and I have chat lists for each of the books and I have my main uh, newsfeed li list and I post to my newsfeed list every day and I have lots of uh, fans who follow me who ask questions about the research that I do. I have um, a chat list on Facebook, King Arthur Man and Myth, um, and uh, hundreds of people follow me there and ask questions. Um, what's the difference between your editing of your nonfiction work and the publishing house's editor for your nonfiction work? My editing is pretty good on the nonfiction. The um, publishing house, the publisher doesn't always know, understand what the book's about um, as far as uh, what points I'm trying to make. And so they don't always catch when I'm um, going off topic or uh, failing to make my point. Um, and uh, so I don't like to give it to them till I'm pretty sure that it's in good shape. Um, and then uh, after they get done making their editorial changes, I go back over it and change things back if they've uh, scrambled something up. Have you ever Googled yourself and what did you find? Yes, always Google yourself. Um, I have found that I am very popular overseas and that my nonfiction is way more popular than my fiction and that uh, online it's got a good list of the universities I've gone to, different um, organizations that I'm involved with um, and uh, all that sort of thing. What is the difference between destructive and constructive criticism of your nonfiction work? Destructive criticism of my nonfiction work generally comes because I specialize in the uh, stories of King Arthur. Um, it generally comes from people who, for whom Arthur must be Celtic and can't be anything else. And I write about um, Lucas Artorius Castus, a Roman soldier, whom I believe was the base of the King Arthur legends. There are other Arthurs over the years and all of their stories joined into a big conglomerate that um, became the Arthurian tradition. But there are a lot of people over in Europe that like that idea and uh, other people like the Japanese and the Australians um, like that that idea but in Britain and the United States they do not like that idea so I get a lot of destructive criticism uh, from them because they just don't like the idea of what I'm writing about. Constructive criticism will point out uh, you spelled that character's name wrong, um, you uh, um, uh, forgot this element in somebody's life, you uh, scrambled these two periods of time um, just basically straighten things out for me. So after I publish a book, I keep a list of all the constructive things people say to me. So if I go to a second edition, then I have it and can make the corrections. How do you deal with negative book reviews? Negative book reviews. I'm getting a lot of those. <laughs> um, I uh, generally ignore them. Sometimes I'll go out on Facebook and find the person and have an extended argument with them. Um, because with my nonfiction, I feel like uh, my reputation is at stake um, with getting the information right. And a lot of the negative book reviews are, um, well, the one I had most recently was that your book said this and that's wrong. And it's like, I'm the author. I know what my book said and that's not what my book said. And um, we, we'll get into spats about that sort of thing. If your book was made into a movie, which style would you like the filmmakers to use? Well, my book was made into a movie. Um, From Scythia to Camelot was the base for uh, Jerry Bruckheimer's 2004 movie, King Arthur. Unfortunately, it took the lawyers a year to negotiate my contract and the script had been written and the movie made by the time I was able to come on full time on the project. So somebody had 
been asked when did King Arthur live and gave the answer that the Celticists use, which is fifth century. I would have said second century. And so a lot of things you see in the movie are a scramble of the second century and the fifth century, which a lot of people didn't like. Um, some people really like the Sarmatians finally getting into the story because uh, Sarmatians are what I think a lot of the Arthurian stories came from. Um, their, their tales that they told. And then they had a, a group of relatives called the Allens and the uh, Allens were mainly over on the continent and they're the ones that practice the sword being plunged into the ground, which may have given rise to the story of the sword and the stone. What advice do you give a writer working on their first book? Advice to a writer on their first nonfiction book. Read everything you can about the topic um, uh, that you think you might need and don't be afraid to go research some more if you're writing along and find you've forgotten to research an area. Um, don't be afraid to rewrite. Don't be afraid to reorganize your work because sometimes you'll get partway through it and realize that another structure is better than the one you've been using. What is the most valuable piece of advice you've been given about writing? Most valuable piece of uh advice I've been giving about writing is seat of the pants to the seat of the chair. Because if you don't write, it's never going to get written. Um, you have to get something down on paper. Um, and then you can, I know, nowadays it's computer. Um, but once you get it written, then you can print it out and find a nice large dining table like I do. And do your rewriting. Use highlighters, use pens, um, make your notes in the margins. And I usually go through maybe 10 drafts of a book. Um, it takes me roughly five years to get a book out when it comes to the time it takes to research, write it, edit it, uh, find a publisher, go through the editing process with them and go through the printing process. And then the marketing process can take forever. So um, it's nothing you do overnight. It's a big time commitment. What book or books are you currently reading? I am actually reading a, a fiction book right now, uh, Magic's Promise by Mercedes Lackey, the uh, latest uh, fan um, nonfiction book that I read was called The Sarmatians. Uh, I've read it a bunch of times before, but I keep going back to it because uh, you forget things, little details, and that information was given to me by Jeffrey Ash. You need to keep reading and rereading the the books that are involved with your work because you'll just you'll forget little details or remember them wrong. It's just a trick of the mind. What does success mean to you? What success means to me is um, that people know my work and know, associate my name with it. I've had a lot of problems over the years because I work with a lot of co-authors of people thinking that the co-author was the main author of the book and that I wasn't um, applying that much information to it. Um, one of the funniest things that happened to me, well, it wasn't funny at the time, but I had a co-author named C. Scott Littleton who died in uh, 2010. But uh, we would go to conferences and um, he would be addressed as Dr. Littleton and I would be addressed as Linda. And that really bugged us because we had, he had an anthropology degree from UCLA and I had a folklore degree from UCLA and folklore is a sub degree of anthropology. And I stopped uh, worrying about the gray in my hair. And as soon as I went gray, then I became Dr. Malcor and it was Dr. Littleton and Dr. Malcor. So, um, that is, uh, don't dye your hair if you're a woman and uh, writing f um, nonfiction. And that is the end of the interview. If you liked it, please click the like, like button below and subscribe to this channel to uh, hear more interviews from me. Talk to you later. Bye.